Hey everybody, uh, we're back. We'll be finally wrapping up Batman the Anime Series Season 3, technically, but it'll be called uh, The New Adventures of Batman and Robin. I didn't even bring it up in the last review that, you know, they've been maturing with the animation, so now you get to see... You get to see bits of blood here and there that you never did in the first season. So I thought that was very uh, a cool dynamic. But uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, don't forget to follow me in the links in the description below. Let me know what you guys think of the Batman the Anime series all together. And then once, since I'm done now, I can get right into Batman Beyond Season 1. So, uh, we'll go through all that. Don't even know how many seasons are those. I can't remember. Pretty sure it's three as well. And then after that, The Batman. Then after that, Batman, uh, Brave and the Bold. So, uh, oh, and, th well, I'm going to leave, you know, the comic book review Batman related <clears throat> as a surprise. <laughs> um, but it might be like a three-parter kind of thing because there's a lot. But I'll leave that as a surprise. Anyway, so uh, beginning right into it with, uh, uh, like like I said, my favorite episodes here. Uh, so the first episode is like Holiday Nights, which is kind of like a, Short little snippets, short little stories like um, Tales of the Jedi kind of thing, where uh, there's fun little escapades in Gotham City, where one Harley and Ivy uh, bring Watts Bruce Wayne to use his checkbook in order to go on a shopping spree until he eventually breaks out of it to stop him. But it's a nice little classic, I argue. And I put this on my TikTok, follow me on my TikTok, by the way, that I made like a little 10 minute rant, basically pouring my heart out about how far they strayed away from what Harley Quinn used to be. And it's supposed to be like a Bonnie and Clyde thing when she, well, not Bonnie and Clyde, but um, Thelma Louise thing with her and Ivy. And they seem to gone. I don't know. Most for the most part, most people would argue they missed the classic '90s Harley Quinn. And I think no shade to Margot Robbie. She just recently just been announced she's about to have her first child. Was good for her. It's just that the hot topic Harley Quinn is just like, even though they kind of went past that, you know, when James Gunn used her, but. I don't know. It, it just seems so off the beaten path with Harley Quinn. Whereas moments that I still enjoy, but for the most part, you can make the argument, uh, th you know, this is like, you know, edgy, not in a fun way, Harley Quinn. But then, like, another little snippet with Batgirl stopping Clayface, you know, who's uh, been sending out a little clay clones not clones but like using clay pieces of himself as you know disguised as children to go rob malls while Renee Montoya and uh, Bullock uh, do this you know Santa and Santa's helper thing at the mall for the children and they're stopping Clayface in the process it's just fun little romps and then the final one which has always been like seared in, into my brain that I always thought it was so headcanon to me. And I'm pretty sure that was in a comic at one point. I don't remember which one. Where it's a, you know, uh, approaching New Year's and, you know, Joker announcing that the following year he won't make any killings, but he want to do it all in one big swell swoop. Before they ring in the new year. Batman ultimately stops him in an epic fashion. And then right at midnight, him and Gordon does this little ritual where they meet up at a 
a little cafe, have a nice coffee, and just cheers to the new year. Hopefully, you know, hopefully, hoping that the next year will be less crazy than the last kind of situation. And it's a nice little thing between the two where they just like hang out because it's like old war buddies kind of situation. Speaking of which, unlike, well, I probably should have brought it up in last season, but it's just, you start to notice that Renee Montoya, Gordon, and Bullock show up less and less as they start to introduce Robin and Dick, you know, Tim Drake Robin, and then uh, Dick Grayson turns into Nightwing, and then we get more action with uh, Batgirl. So it, you know, with them into the fray as Batman's supporting cast with more screen time, it kind of reduces the need for Bullock and Renee and Gordon. They show up from time to time, but not as much uh, as previously, which is kind of a shame. And I'm not a fan of how Gordon looks. He looks, I, I get it, he's getting a little older, but he seems so like, like his, you know, like his body's eating itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. He look a little gaunt and like, like he needed like a sandwich or something. And I've never been a fan of that look. Like, it's so off-putting. It's like, God forbid, you can't just have him look like the same model as you had in the first season. Because that is just like, very on point look for Gordon. At least in my opinion. There's other interpretations of Gordon that I also love. Like, in The Batman, I like that look there. Uh, And, of course, you know, uh, uh, Gary Oldman, uh, his Gordon is, you know, iconic, my, you know, favorite as well. Uh, But those three particular stand out to me. Anyway, uh... We like I said, we introduced with Tim Drake, and we get a little bit of information about his father, who got mixed up in the bad crowd, and subtly hint that he was bumped off by uh, some criminal elements because he used to work for Two Face. Now, in the comics, as I recall, not only he's alive, as I think he still is. It's been a while because things change over time. But I don't recall him being mixed up in a back. Well, I'm pretty sure he's missing in a back crowd, but just, I don't know. Uh, you know, they made him like more of a bad person in the show than it is in the comics. That's all I do remember in terms of Tim Drake's father. Um, but he somehow got a hold of a batarang and using it so expertly. And I just call BS on that because like, I don't know how long he had it, but how you know how to freaking, well, he's pretty much like a, uh, uh, Batman fan. Cause you got posters and uh, newspaper clippings of Batman in his room. So I guess you couldn't fathom he once he found a batarang he'd been practicing with it for the longest time but I don't know it, it just seems like it's, it's certain weapons you just shouldn't know how to use shouldn't know how to use because you just saw somebody else uh, wield it because <clears throat> I've seen plenty of movies with people using AKs doesn't mean I'll just know how to use one because I saw somebody else on the news use one. That's just kind of, it's just, you know, it should be feasible unless you actually been taught that by the person themselves. Uh, but uh, Tim Drake has been a lot of people's favorite Robins over the years. 
But me personally, I grew up with Dick Grayson Robin, so he's my Robin, my favorite Robin. And I love Nightwing. At some point, I want to do like a Nightwing comic review at some point in the future. I don't know when. Don't hold me to that because uh, I don't think it's going to be this year. But at some point, I want to do like a cool Nightwing story for the channel. And the costumes based off of a Kryptonian uh, superhero of legend from uh, from uh, Superman's little tales to Dick Grayson uh, that somehow he got word from, I guess, the crystals or something like that. So that explains how uh, Dick Grayson came up with the Nightwing persona. And the costume design... Uh, very simple, classic. Doesn't need to be overly complicated. Uh, and of course, I do enjoy Tim Drake, but the problem is in the comics, a couple of years ago, I don't know if they even really do much with it, but a couple of years ago, they decided to make Tim Drake bisexual. And it just seems so out of nowhere and retroactively retconned because Tim Drake, more often than not, people don't even know what to do with a character. It's been a thing with a lot of characters, Harley Quinn being another one, trying to force her into the shape of the Deadpool shaped hole, and it just doesn't fit where the character's origin points are. Because you don't know what to do with the character. Let's make her another wacky Deadpool type and make it fit and force it to make it fit. And with Tim Drake, you just slap a label on him thinking like, oh, we can just do something because he's LGBT, because he's bisexual. We got can tell so many stories with that. Same thing with John Kent Superman, you know, Clark's son. Uh, it's like, oh, uh, not only they forced him to age up just on like a BS short arc, but also just shoved a label on him just out of the blue. And it's like, you don't even have like a legit good reason outside of trying to A, score brownie points to a particular community. Uh, but B, you think you can just, you know, oh, we can tell this gay stories with this person about their sexuality. And it's like, it's okay for a person to be whatever gender, whatever is sexuality or whatever. But you can't make that the entire character. There's more to a person than just being their race or sexual orientation. And I feel, that's, I feel that is lazy. Tim Drake is an awesome character in his own right. But... You got a bunch of good writers in there. Not one of you can make up a solid story for Tim Drake. Like I said, this just seems lazy. And he has such a rich history at this point. And that's why I just kind of feel like bothered by that. And it's kind of insulting the people of that community. Because like, oh, you're not, they're not a monolith. Just because like, oh, like we just only tell, you know, because John Constantine is bisexual as well. His stories ain't centered around his sexual orientation. It, it, it just it seems like this lazy to me. Anyway, but we get an introduction to Tim Drake. I love the design. Uh, so he dons the Robin costume after he says, it's kind of like off based off of a story where is leads into the uh, another episode in uh, uh, not growing pains. Uh, that's Clayface story. Uh, what is it? Oh, wounds. Where Dick tells you know Tim the story of how like him and Batman had a falling out, which probably like the you know there's very. A uh, few times in an uh, animated show where you actually can feel the impact of a hit 
because you see people get hit all the time in the show. But this packed so much of a punch, no pun intended. Like in Justice League Unlimited, where Superman goes all out against Dark Side, you feel that hit when he fights uh, Captain Marvel, uh, Sazam. When their fight, you feel that impact. Uh, uh, with uh, Dick Grayson hitting Bruce, that weight of that hit means so much more than Batman's hit on the Joker kind of situation where, you know, uh, Batman seems to be like, not like uh, understanding the room. He just hyper focused on catching this bad guy, but he got like a kid nearby and Robin's Dick Grayson. It's like, Batman, not in front of the kid. Let's ease up. And like, not until I get information. And then he just dips out. Because it, 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 that's just the uh, straw that broke the camel's back. But it was a lot more where Dick is growing up. You know, he wants to be his own person. And, you know, uh, Bruce wasn't just respecting his point of view, his boundaries. There's a lot going on. And just re- like a pivot point. And it's a nice little journey because we've been following uh, Dick Grayson for the longest time since season one. So we see like a steady regression of him learning from Bruce. Uh, but I think s- since... Uh, Robin's reckoning we started to notice like little by little where Batman is like you know yeah he he's in charge he's you know he's leading the, this uh, partnership but you know whenever you know it's supposed to be a partnership but Batman you know because he's not like expressing himself properly I guess but it just doesn't sit well with uh, Dick. And he's like, okay, I had, had enough of this. You know, because you're not taking what I say into account. We're supposed to be partners. You know, Batman started all this. But Robin Dick Grayson paid his dues. So he should, at a point, have a say. Which Bruce can't, like, you know, let go of the reins a bit. So they end up falling out. And... Uh, of course, like in the story, you know, Nightwing goes to Bloodhaven to have his own city to look after without bumping, worrying about bumping into Bruce. Very once in a while, he shows up in Gotham to help out. So he tells Tim that, because it's based off the comics on, roughly about the comics, where in that, Tim, uh, especially after the death of Jason Todd, one of the most pivotal and most iconic stories in comic book history in general, not just with DC, where uh, Jason Todd, the second Robin, got killed by the Joker in an explosion. And it left Bruce angry, bitter, hard than normal. And, you know, uh, Tim Drake, you know, sees him and, you know, see how, like, just from the outside looking in, how, uh, you know, out of sorts he's been. And this is not how, like, I saw Batman growing up. He goes to uh, Grayson and it's like, you gotta be Robin again because he's acting, you know, he's acting kind of weird. He's gonna be going too far one day. He needs a Robin to balance him out. But, Grayson not so subtly hinted at Tim like well he needs a Robin I can't be that anymore because you know I'm on my own man now and I'm not going to be re- uh, uh, reduced to a sidekick anymore but if he needs a sidekick I know somebody who might be able to fit the bill and that's where they kind of you know incorporated those story beats into these two you know particular episodes uh, uh, but it's a great introduction to Tim Drake, fun edition. 
And in the Batman, I think that's supposed to be Tim Drake as well. Or at least maybe like a mashup between all three, all the first three Robins. Because there was no Jason Todd or Dick Grayson in the Batman. So uh, it's just, they let that, you know, just Tim Drake. Because at that time, Tim Drake was like the Robin at the time. When the Batman was, you know, broadcasting. Uh, we get a, you know, uh, final scene with uh, uh, Mr. Freeze, who's now just a head. It was as creepy as hell. Because, you know, he's living as an immortal essentially because of his affliction his body you know was breaking down and now he's like using a a, a new upgraded suit where he can still be mobile and he's on a mission to you know uh, watch other people's sorrow as he destroys the things that they care most about because after the last time we've seen him, it's probably uh, after the DC animated film Batman Sub Zero, where Nora Freeze is cured and she's living a normal life. In this show, in this episode, you know, the doctor that helped her cure her, she and him got together and married, but now, like, Freeze got nothing else to live for so he ends up kidnapping these scientists to like you know I guess you know monitor his like vitals and stuff like that he plans on dropping an ice bomb on the city so it could be in perpetual frozen wasteland until Batman and Batgirl finally stop him but he ends up because he just like ahead now, he somehow escaped. So this is the last time we saw him. Until we get to Batman Beyond, where a particular unique episode with him coming back for a one-off, which is uh, pretty fun. Uh, uh, shoot. Oh, uh, I'm gonna cover like the ones that I really really enjoyed. Uh, like uh, the ventriloquist, you know, he is uh, at least, ah, oh, crap, uh, what's his real name? Uh, Arnold Wesker. Which, if they do like a live action Scarface, the comedian, um, uh, crap, what's that comedian's name with the puppets? Because he's so freaking funny. Uh, Jeff Dunham Jeff Dunham who's an amazing comedian and he uses uh, puppets he could easily be a live action ventriloquist with and have him make his own Scarface and does his own thing that would be fun that would be like a really uh, fun idea because to use, utilize Scarface as, like, I, I don't know. If some people might argue, how can you make, a, like, a solid story with him as a main villain? You can do it if you got the right writers and, like, a good story premise. Because, honestly, it's no different from, like, a Godfather type of story. With a little guy named Scarface. Uh... But uh, Arnold Wesker is uh, seemingly cured, and he, you know, and goes to show that people complain like, "Oh, well, like Bruce Wayne doesn't do anything but beat up people with his, you know, uh, you know, use money to just create bat suits to beat up people." But no, we actually see him here, you know, create housing for people who are rehabil- rehabilitated from the justice system to find a place to live and uh, set up where they can get like, you know, automatic jobs, 
you know, with whatever Wayne Corporation, you know, or facility he has going on. So they have like a job with uh, that makes a very decent amount of money. So it goes so like, yeah, he's doing that stuff. You just don't often see it because that is just typically a boring story. No one wants to see like the nitty gritty details of what he does as Bruce Wayne for the bulk of a story. You know, that doesn't make, you know, typically makes a good thing, a, a good story to watch. But it's nice to know that for at least five to ten minutes, we get to see it from a particular medium. Him actually put it in the work in order to make sure these criminals, once they serve their time, have something to build off of. So Arnold uh, goes home and he's still hearing the voices, a voice of Scarface. And luckily, like, Bruce is still monitoring him. And you see, like, Scarface's goons trying to, like, force him back into his Scarface persona. Like, we missed the boss. Bring him out. And Arnold, you know, is just like never's character. He doesn't want to, he never wants to, he's suffering from a psychosis. But he doesn't want to be a part of the criminal lifestyle uh uh but batman makes sure he nipped all that stuff in the butt like you know wesker is off limits don't let me catch you here again but you know bruce starting to notice that somebody planted like a box with like a a voice recording of scarface there to kind of make mess with uh, arnold's mind and then Arnold gets like a phone call, seemingly from Scarface, from a payphone. And as a kid, this always freaked me out because it's like, okay, this is kind of spooky now. Where Bruce is chasing seemingly Scarface, who's getting up and running. This little puppet is somehow alive, but it turns out it's some uh, little person that was hired by in Scarface's thugs to pretend to be Scarface in order to uh, mess with Arnold's mind because his mind is very fragile. He's only just getting better. So Scarface eventually makes a return, but uh, uh, it's not even Batman. It's Arnold who took control of his own life and make finally made a choice of his own that wasn't dictated by his uh, alternate persona because Scarface is pretty much Arnold's like uh, kind of like with whole Two-Face situation where it's like his dominant persona manifested uh, not doctor but you catch my drift you know saying what he really wants to say doing what he you know like you know he's very nevish and super introverted and not confrontational but that man that part because he doesn't stand up for himself i guess or just takes it constantly and don't fight back that just gets manifested into this alternate that turns into scarface and just does what like arnold steps up where arnold just doesn't want to do it where scarface does and funny how like Scarface calls him the dummy because he has to do as in his own words it's like geez I have to do everything around here uh but Arnold finally made a decision on his own and stood up for himself and used the Tommy gun to mow down Scarface in a like gruesome fashion done to a puppet where he falls into like a fan blades that turns them into like dust essentially so Arnold's now finally free of Scarface and living like a normal life so it's a nice little moment uh, uh, we get an uh, introduction you know we get the return of Scarecrow where now he came up with a concoction where instead of causing fear, this new chemical takes away fear, which is equally as dangerous 
that he wants to introduce it to the populace. Bruce ends up catching a dose of it. And now with Tim Drake, you know, by his side, he's starting to notice like he's taking like wilder risk. And of course he says he's going to, you know, take an antidote, but he still got like, we got Scar- uh, uh, Scarecrow to catch. We don't have time, but he's taking wilder risk, you know, going further, more violent than necessary. But, you know, luckily Tim Drake was there. Being the sidekick, uh, he's making sure that his partner is okay and forcing him to take the uh, antidote. But there's one funny moment where, you know, Tim temporarily got Batman tied up and he's trying to fake him out. It's like, you're right. Uh, I was going off the line. Thank you. It's, and it's like, Tim, like, you almost got me. And it's like, because you know, Batman doesn't thank people. <laughs> uh, he just thinks it's like, he's always thought it's like the thank yous and the sorries are always, always implied. He never really, you know, I mean, he says it, but it's so rare. And, and it's just, you've been around a person long enough, you know their mannerisms. So, of course, Tim was wise to the trickery. But he ultimately get the antidote and stop Scarecrow. Uh, 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 we get uh, an introduction to Firefly, which is an underrated Batman villain that shows up from time to time in TV shows or like in the video game with Arkham Origins, which he was really fun boss fight in that. They could easily do something with Firefly. I mean, the DCU, they kind of, you know, dumped it, you know, when I guess it it wasn't, uh, they didn't think they was going to have some kind of viable uh, return on their investment. Because they wanted to make a Batman movie with Brandon Fraser as Firefly as the main bad guy, but they completely dumped the project. But Firefly is an interesting villain that you can do something with, with like a pyromaniac, and he can easily be like a main villain in a story where he just utilizes different uses and weapons uh, with fire. So uh, it's really dope. Garfield Lens uh, is the second character, or at least third character I know with a name Garfield. First one being Garfield the Cat. Second one is uh, Beast Boy. His first name is Garfield. And Garfield Lens Firefly. Uh, He works as like a pyrotechnics guy for this... uh, a musical artist he used to date uh, named Shannon. Uh, oh, no. Uh, sorry, not Shannon. Uh, Cassidy. Her singing this sucks, but it's not the priority. But you'll think, like, with the show's capabilities of utilizing uh, music and, sc- and score, and a couple of the voice actors is talented in singing you could have at the very least if the main actress who does the voice for Cassidy isn't that great of a singer you could have dubbed over with somebody else from the cast who can sing like Arlene Sorkin is you know very good at singing you could have uh, used her voice for the singing voice in order to like really sell the fact that she's like a musical artist. But irregardless, uh, she uh, is, I want to say a flake, but she's, she, uh, no pun intended, she's a little spark plug. Cause she goes from one relationship to the next, but this one kind of backfired 
the puns, I'm sorry, where now Garfield feels scorned, and so clearly he wasn't all there to begin with, decides, you know, he the, you know, it kind of reminds me of Mysterio from, you know, Spider-Man the Animated Series, where he goes too far with the special effects and nearly kills the, the girl he was into. It's very one-to-one -one if you think about it. And, man, can you imagine, like, a fight between, you know, Firefly and Mysterio? But then again, a fight between Scarecrow and Mysterio will be, will be a little bit more interesting because one uses illusions and the other uses fear toxins. Both messes with your mind in different ways. That'll be a little bit more interesting of a fight. But leave a comment below. Let me know who will win in a fight between Mysterio and the Scarecrow. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, Batman and... Uh, uh, well, Garvin has turned to like a bit of a stalker now. Uh, obsessed with getting her... Uh, back of his his uh, girlfriend, but he also has like machinations to like burn the city. He's pretty much an arsonist. And Batman and Batgirl uh, do their best to stop Garfield and protect this pop singer. Uh, but ultimately, thanks to Alfred, who uh, suggests he tries out this new suit, which in this season they really utilize different various potentials for bat suits for Batman. Very like uh uh action figures where like, you know, where Batman can utilize different types of suits for different scenarios. So you got this flame retardant suit. And you'll see a lot of this in the Batman uh and then Brave and the Bold very heavily utilizing different types of suits for different types of occasions. Uh and this suit is very reminiscent to like the proto Batman Beyond suit, almost. Uh, so they end up stopping Firefly, but the episode ends on kind of like a bittersweet note where now that Cassidy is safe from uh, Firefly, but because of the ordeal left there with. Uh, uh, Wait, uh, pyrophobia now. Uh, and next is the ultimate thrill. Introducing Roxy Rocket, whose first appearance was in a uh, comic book based off the animated su uh, series uh, itself. But in this episode, it's her first, you know, introduction in an animated uh, scenario. And she's an adrenaline junkie utilizing a mobile rocket to, you know, fly around the city. And she's pretty much like another version of Catwoman where she steals things. But the only difference is she's, you know, in it for the thrill of it. And she used to be like a, a, a an actress. And she could not uh, be insured anymore because she keeps amping up the danger where it's unnecessary risk to her life, but she doesn't really care. She, you know, is high off the the adrenaline. And so she works for a cobble pot to steal for him for money, but she's so uh, extrovert with it, where it's like she does not, you know, keep a low profile. So now she got Batman on her tail. And she's just like so infatuated with Batman, which I really wish they really utilized Roxy Rocket a lot more in the comics. Because she is an incredible character. You can definitely do some stuff with. The next time we actually see her make a return is in Superman the Animated Series for one particular episode where she tried to do some uh, pull off a uh, crime in Metropolis, but easily gets stopped. Uh, and there was one moment where I think it kind of, I didn't say go over our heads as kids, but it was very implied that she was literally getting off by the thrill when Batman is holding her down 
on the rocket, looking about the uh, Clyde with the nearby cliff. It's like, I thought you liked the thrill. And she just literally, like, just, like, breakfast at Tiffany's, you know, like, uh, 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 yeah, the thrill. That's what I'm talking about. It, it, it's like, God, you know, like a whole, they wiped, well, the thing crashed anyway, but they, that sea part needed to be wiped down after that, <laughs> you know, that uh, ecstasy she went through. But she ends up getting stopped, but. She was like a fun character. I love her freaking design. This whole Rocketeer vibes. Because like, she's a legit like character. A fun character you can easily utilize many, many times over. Uh, man, I love Roxy Rocket. She's fun. Um, uh, mean Seasons is another favorite. Like, I still remember Mean Seasons. It's probably my favorite episode the entire third season here. Uh, where they introduce... The villain Calendar Girl, which is like a uh, a flip, a gender flip from uh, Calendar Man, which they always wanted to do. But I guess because it was so, the villains were so heavy handed with the male side, they thought they can I guess flip it. Speaking of genders, there's been a lot of villains in this season. Well, not to say a lot, but at least a few villains in this season, like. Clayface, Penguin. Previously, they always had, like, you know, male henchmen. But in this season, there's been, like, a, I guess, a correction. I won't say a correction, but I guess the people behind the scenes started took notice that there's been, you know, overuse of male henchmen with a lot of villains. So they thought to mix it up by giving a couple of these villains female hench ladies, which is fine, but it's like, it seems like they're just like uh, topping each other, essentially. But anyway, uh, oh, so I was talking about uh, oh yeah, Mean Seasons. So, if you know anything about Calendar Man, is a character I if I was writing for a Batman comic, he's the one I want to you uh, use because you can because after I saw him in the Arkham games. He seems so interesting as a villain where he get, you know, he's a serial killer that commits crimes on holidays. And given the fact that if you look up online the amount of holidays and special events and acknowledgments of this, and that, and the third each month that we've been inundated with, you know, for years now, you can utilize a uh, counter man for a wide variety of things. Like, I don't know, can you imagine you write a story about a uh, calendar man killing, you know, you know, certain people from the LGBTQ plus community on Pride Month, calendar man that committed crimes there, or, or like, you know, like mental awareness month and he kills people that, you know, uh, you know, you know, males that was just going to their therapy for the first time and murders them. And it's just like leaving clues behind with like with calendar dates and stuff like that. That'd be so interesting. How fun is that? Uh, yeah, there's and this is my idea, mind you. So this is a recording as of today. That was my idea. If somebody steals that, that is mine, and I get the royalties from that because that is a legit good idea. You can do something a lot with that, like a mini event with Calendar Man v Batman. Um, but Calendar Girl is like a former model who is kind of speaks a lot to like the Hollywood industry where, you know, a young starlet can be a hot new thing for a while, but when you get a little older, she stopped getting, well, it's less so the case nowadays than it probably was back even in, heck, even in the 90s, the 80s and 70s when, you know, uh, certain stylists get up in age and it's like, you know, not like uh, sellable anymore like they used to. We kind of like veered off that now where even Sharon Stone can easily and Angelina Jolie can still rake in the box office numbers as long as you give them like good uh, scripts to work with. 
So it's not over with them if they get older. Hell, Sema Hayek is still pulling numbers despite her age. She's 50, and she still is like a banger of a, a, a of a looker and hell of an actress. So you can still do something, you know, uh, with them. But that's a story beat they went with at that time, and it's very interesting. So, you know, the people that keep turning her down, she takes her revenge out on, like, one particular holiday, like, you know, Eyes of March, and, you know, attacking people with Easter eggs, and then Fourth of July with pyrotechnic gloves, like she's freaking Jubilee from the X-Men. And then, you know, Autumn close by Halloween. And then, you know, setting up, like, a taking over animatronic, animatronic T-Rex to go after Batman is kind of fun. But, uh... Uh, the is like a running theme with people getting older that Bruce has to, you know, for the first time has to contend with because one of his employees is being forced to retire because the retirement age is like a hard 65 or 67, but he kind of changed that up because he clearly didn't want to leave. So it's like, no, it's like you can stay here as long as you're able to. Uh, but now is the first time because it kind of will lead into Batman Beyond. It's like Bruce has been Batman for so long. He never crossed. It never crossed his mind. The fact that he's going to be getting up there in age soon. And he's checking for gray hairs and stuff like that. Around this point, he would have been in his early 40s, maybe. Because in the first two season, seasons, he probably would have been in his like, you know, in his probably early 30s and now he's getting to his early 40s so and with uh calendar girl the when after she gets busted because she's wearing this face mask thing like oh she's going through these nips and tucks and stuff like that now she's looks grotesque but as soon as bullock takes the mask off she is like you know nothing's wrong with her but it's like the reverse two-face where like, her scars is on the inside and she can't see, you know, the, uh, her natural beauty, beauty anymore. She only sees the imperfections, which is sad, but man, it's a great little story and very grown up kind of, you know, story beat for young kids that can fairly follow this. Uh, like I said, I appreciate cartoons that don't treat children like the it is. You can tell, you know, relatively grown up, uh, you know, uh, topics in a children's medium without it being kind of hacky or like they're preaching to you kind of thing. Uh, one second. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, Mean Seasons, man, that was my favorite episode, man. Uh, uh, Demon Within, where they introduced Atrigan, the demon, uh, merged with the uh, character Jason Blood, uh, who you might have saw in many other DC projects like Justice League Unlimited. But the, my first introduction to Atrigan was in this Batman show and uh, in Batman Brave and the Bold he shows up quite a few times where you get to see Batman team up with you know various different types of characters from the D uh, DC universe and he has this they tend to forget this whenever they bring in after again in certain comics or uh, animated movies but I appreciate it when writers remember that this demon likes to rhyme everything. In his dialogue, he always rhymes. And whenever they don't include that, it bothers me a bit because that's his thing. It, and it's like a gimmick that only he has that makes him very unique. And it kind of bugs me when certain writers tend to forget that. And maybe they just didn't forget, they just don't want to be bothered worrying about or thinking about coming up with rhyming schemes which is shouldn't be freaking that hard you got the source don't you you got google don't you uh it's the same lame excuse as 
they have about Riddler. Like, I don't want to come up with riddles. God, it's so brain teasers. And it's like, you don't necessarily need to just be only about the riddles. You can just make legit, you know, jigsaw level puzzles. Or like Saw, like the Saw movie type of puzzles. You can just incorporate that with the uh, Riddler schemes. Like the Arkham games managed to do it very effectively. You can't just do that. But we introduced to also the main villain of the story, Clarion the Witch Boy, who's co- going after the same thing Jason is with this uh, branding iron uh, created by uh, Morgan Le Fay during the times of Arthurian legend. And it's mystical, and you you use it to mind control uh, a particular, you know, uh, you know, creature. So, Clarion used it to separate uh, Etrigan from Jason Blood, but it was Etrigan to keep Jason young all these years, so now he's starting to age. But thanks to, you know, the team up with Batman and Robin, they managed to uh, get that branded iron from him, but you get to actually see Batman tang with magic for the first time. Now, of course, he see some mystical stuff with like Raza Ghoul with the Lazarus Pits, but not like full blown magic. And of course, it's like a running joke in comics where Batman does not like to deal with magical characters because not he's very logical and magic is not something he can rationalize with, so he just rather not deal with it. When he's tangling, tangling with Zatanna or John Constantine, he's always rolling his eyes like, "Uh, I do not want to deal with this crap. Uh, but it's, it's like a fun running joke. Um, but uh, you get to see some kind of body horror a bit where Clarion is trying to mess with Batman's body, but Jason's, you know, home mystically helping out with Batman so he can fight off Clarion. But they managed to reintegrate Etrigan with Jason Blood to keep him from dying so that way they can finally stop Clarion. Uh, fun episode. Uh, I really enjoy that one. Uh, we had, uh, Beware the Creeper. When another DC character that I've seen utilize in the background of Justice League uh, Unlimited, but this is the only time we actually see some actual uh, the actual character teaming up with Batman in in a prominent role. But the way I actually utilize him outside of this particular show. For this particular episode, I could be wrong. He might have been using Batman Brave and Bold, but I cannot recall. I might be wrong on that. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, this character could be utilized more. I see, I see prospects of this character, and is Jack Ryder, which you might recall him in the Arkham games, where you know he's a reporter is very like the male version of Lois Lane. But he ends up trying to get a scoop on Joker, but end up getting caught by him, sprayed with laughing gas, and pushed into those chemicals uh, in the Ace Chemical Company. And all that in combination turned him into what we see him as the Creeper, which I don't recall it being his actual uh creation from the comics back in the Silver Age, I think. Uh, But I think most people probably remember his creation being from this episode. So I guess it's kind of like the whole Batman 89. People like to think that Joker became the Joker because he was pushed into, you know, the chemicals at, at the factory. And they just... That's that, and they can you know, sleep soundly on that thought. Um, but 
this guy, you know, is not Deadpool, but he's kind of like, if you remember, like, Freakazoid, the 90s show around this time, Freakazoid, he's not, like, breaking the fourth wall, but he's very wacky to the point where he's even, like, you know, annoys Joker and Harley, as wacky as they are. And he's immediately infatuated with uh, Harley Quinn, where he's pretty much sipping on her the whole night. But he also, at the same time, want to, you know, you know, capture Joker. He's obsessed with capturing her Joker. But, uh, so, Batman and Robin, you know, tries to stop this crazy escapades. Um, but, um, they managed to neutralize the creeper. And it's a funny little, you know, acting from Mark Hamill where the Joker is like begging <laughs> Batman. It's like, you gotta stop him. He's crazy. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh, but they managed to get, you know, some temporary antidote to Jack Ryder in, in a form of a patch. So that way he can, since nobody knows he's the creeper outside of using his freaking card, but I guess people can say like he stole it, but a good reporter or a good detective could easily trace that back to him, but whatever. So Batman tells him, as long as you have that patch on the, your days as the creeper is over, you can live a normal life. But of course the end shot you hear in the background that he takes off the patch and here's his cackling laughter. So the creeper is kind of like, you know, anti-hero. So he's, you know, going to save the day in his own way kind of thing. Then you get Mad Love, which is like a reinterpretation of Harley Quinn's origin story based off the comics, Mad Love, where she's a doctor, uh, a psychologist, uh, that worked at Arkham Asylum, got assigned to the Joker and ends up from trying to give him some therapy where he turned it around and, you know, is thera uh, therapizing her. Where he gives, it's kind of like the whole Heath Ledger Joker thing. It's like he gives different stories about his upbringing to many different people. And Batman has to bring it up to Harley, like, did he tell you about how like, his father hit him? That one time he went to the ice cream store and she cries and it's like, it was the circus. He's like, and it's like the, cause they reintroduced that uh, beat with uh, the Harley Quinn show where people have to drive home to Harley that this guy does not care about you. He got into your head. He was an easy target to him. Uh, you got to snap out of it. He does not care about you. And this is like the first time you actually see, well, you don't see, but it's very implied that Joker, you know, you know, uh, hurts Harley whenever he's angered. He's obviously a toxic relationship where he loves her in one moment, but he's a Joker. He, he doesn't care about anything. He's got obsessions, but he utilizes people as tools for his own machinations. He does not care. So of course he pretends to care. And he probably does all kinds of wild stuff with her. But she sees it as love. Uh, but as Batman pointed out to Joker. She's actually the closest one to actually nailing me. Uh, uh, that anybody else including you has ever gotten. And which obviously angers Joker to no end because the fact that his own sidekick managed to come close to doing the deed that Joker spent his entire adult life trying to do but never got close, which is defeating Batman once and for all. And she could have easily, as he pointed out, because she he admitted he uh Harley had Batman dead to rights. And if she wasn't so obsessed with you trying to prove something to you, she would have been put, been able to pull it off. It was an amazing uh, a bit of dialogue for Batman. It's really, really good. But of course, 
you know, Joker seemingly dies, but somehow leaves like a flower in Harley's cell as she's brought in. And then, of course, she gets swept up, swept up off her feet once again by his kind gesture. As he goes hot and cold very fast, and she just riding the wave. And then the last episode I want to tackle, because everything else seems very lackluster, like Critters, Critters is like a farmer with like chemicals that turn, you know, animals into, farm animals into uh, creatures under his sway, which is very lame and boring. Uh, but the last one I really want to talk about is Judgment Day, where we see this other new character called the Judge, who uh, is working for this other brand new DA, which don't know what happened to that lady who was the DA around the time of the episode trial. Don't know why she didn't keep her on, because she could have easily been like a cool supporting character for the Batman, uh, ro- uh, not Rose Gallery, but Batman supporting cast. But um, we get this new DA who decides like, uh, I need my own little vigilante to help me, you know, score points with the public. So he enlists the help of this mysterious figure who dress up in old uh, garments of Victorian or colonial judges with the powder wig and everything like that and got this silhouetted mask on and he dispenses judgment on various villains and leaving them uh, critically injured. And of course, Batman and the public trying to figure out who this uh, person is. And of course, the DA is like, oh, if Gordon can have his own vigilante, I don't see why I can't have mine. Uh, but it turns out he hit, was doing kickbacks. And now once the judge is going after, you know, he went after the Penguin, and then Croc, and then Two-Face. And then he utilizes this massive gavel that utilizes like a mallet. Batman uh, studies it and realizes it's part of some kind of trophy with the plaque taken off. It was only given to high prestigious judges and lawyers. And lo and behold, uh, one of the lawyers who has this is Two-Face, Harvey Dent. And it turns out the judge is Two-Face once Batman finally stops him and busted uh, this DA of his uh, kickback schemes. And it turns out that part of Harvey Dent's personality who's, you know, all about dispensing justice, his need for to dispense justice on the criminal element has been suppressed, I guess, so long. It turned into a third personality that even to Two-Face didn't even know he had. And he was dispensing justice on himself. That's how he some the judge somehow knew about Harvey's little secret back rooms to help him escape if something goes down it was completely blocked off so you see Harvey in his cell like you know in his mind it, the judge persona is trying to dispense sentence on him how did the defendant plead guilty 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 and it's kind of sad like man th- you know this dude is like all kinds of messed up in the mind to like a very deep degree. And I'm thinking like, man, you could easily make this like a legit thing with the Two-Face character. But maybe people might think it was like overly complicated, but you can do something with this judge character uh, and make it a part of like Two-Face's, I argue, make it still his part of his personality that comes out every once in a while that Batman has to deal with. Uh, or somebody takes up the mantle of the judge and to be like the punisher uh, in this judge persona. Kind of like, you know, how Jason Todd took up the mantle of Red Hood from the Joker. Uh, somebody can take up the whole judge persona from Two-Face. That could easily be, you know, you can make a solid story out of that. But that was 
all the episodes I really, really enjoyed from season three of Batman the Animated Series. All the others were either okay or like very lackluster. Oh, another one. One more. There's one more. The one where like uh, uh, Girls Night Out where Livewire is being transferred to uh, Gotham with scientists that, in hopes of curing her of her electrical powers. And since Superman and, and Batman are out of town for various reasons, Batgirl's you know, looking after Gotham in the meantime, and Supergirl's looking after Metropolis in the meantime, and uh, Batman ends up contacting Supergirl in order to check up on things since Livewire is like a powerhouse. Probably too much for Batgirl to handle by herself, so Supergirl, Supergirl goes to Metropolis to like look over things. And then we also get like Harley and Ivy partnering up again, trying to steal some stuff. They end up teaming up with Livewire. Uh, and now these uh, female roles finest is taking on these three uh, villainous women. And I love how like just Livewire is kind of taking over the group and pretty much pushing Harley and Ivy into the whole role of hench women for her because she has more power than Ivy. So you can easily see like the instant hierarchy, you know, happening. It's like, you know, she's large and in charge personality, you know, cause I like this. Cause if this kind of episode is made today, they all be like very girly, girly sisterhood thing going on. Like, no, they're villainesses. You can make the argument for Harley and Ivy because they're actually legit best friends. But, Livewire isn't like like that. She is like, no, I'm a charge. I got the power. You know, like you guys do what I say kind of thing. But I love this actress who uh, voices Livewire because I love the way she calls Superman super jerk. This is the way she says it. It's just so freaking funny. She's just like a shock jock that, you know, gain electrical powers. And it's like, man, you can do something like that with her today. Not like in that Superman uh, animated show that's on HBO Max, the Superman anime. I don't like that version of Livewire. This whole combat character thing is kind of played out. It's like you, with the wor days of podcasting and stuff like that, you can still utilize the whole shock jock thing and the whole fake news type of thing with Live wire spreading misinformation about Superman that could easily be you can do something legit with that. I'm just like, that's how I would do it. That's how I would do it with Live Wire. She's an awesome character, she's fun, and it's like a you know, you need to put some respect on like Live Wire's name because you keep utilizing the same old Zod and Lex Luthor, bringing Parasite and uh, uh, Live Wire. And not that crazy com, com, uh, bat, GI Joe types either. Like I don't want to look at that. You know, they don't need to be military brats or enforcers. You know, just regular degular uh, people uh, that get powers that isn't like, you know, uh, hip to hand to hand combat, but it utilizes power to compensate for that. Uh, but it was a fun episode just to see these two girls, you know, kicking it and kicking butt. Very fun. But that is Batman the Animated Series done. Next time I'll do a TV show review, it'll be for Batman Beyond. So look forward to that soon. I'll see you guys in a little bit as I'll be covering the next comic book event, Marvel House of X, Powers of X. So look forward to that. And I'll see you guys soon. Follow me and links in the description below. Let me know what you guys think of Batman the Anime Series. What was your favorite episodes? Which, how you rank the seasons? What you think of the animation? How they grew? All that stuff. And um, I'll see you soon. Take care.